pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure because this is truly an interdisciplinary collaborative project. Um, there are so many people we want to acknowledge. Um, first of all, let's go to the website. Maybe again. And we'll go to the acknowledgement page. Um, we had a great, great team effort in this with University of Idaho personnel and most importantly, uh, the Coeur d'Alene. Our partners, co-PIs, co-investigators, truly something from get-go, from the research design to the implementation to the final products. Um, this was very much a collaborative effort. I want to acknowledge Leanne. I want to acknowledge Carol Dean. <coughs> Audra and Michelle, those four women uh, from the tribe were our content team along with myself. And it's kind of interesting. This is, this is a generation of Coeur d'Alene's in their 20s, 30s, and 40s who have tremendous responsibility with caring forth the culture, the hen quinet, their ways of life in the world to next generation. This is their language program. This is their cultural program. Um, and they've worked really, really well with the elders. And we kind of realized, we kind of joked about this because we would have uh, meetings on a weekly basis and sometimes a couple of weeks together that we all shared together the same elders. And it is the elders we want to right off the bat acknowledge. Um, many of them are not with us anymore, but this project is only a result of what we, Leanne, Carol Dean, uh, Michelle, um, Audra, and myself have learned over the last 25 years um, from elders such as Lawrence Arepa, Lawrence Nicodemus, uh, Lucy Finley, Cliff Sy John, so many more. Um, their voices we hope to carry on. And it's kind of appropriate that as we've tried to link with those who have gone on across the river and are preparing the way for us, those who have gone on before us, this project tries to link with the future. And I know that we had a great opportunity, thanks to Sadal and others, dealing with the Hoist students this summer. We actually, the first demo we had of this project was with the Hoist students. And once Brian and I, these two old white dudes, sat down and turned it on, the project, those students went right to it. It resonated. It was a way that they could effectively communicate. So we are very pleased with, with that app. So that sort of linkage is really important in understanding this. So that was our content team. Um, uh, the virtual world wizard, <laughs> Brian Cleveland, he'll, um, such a great partnership, uh, just so expanding, so much work and effort he put into this. And then the, the folks from the North uh, West Knowledge Network, and I know uh, our co-PI Jeremy's here, if he'd stand, and Marissa's here, I see her, can't hide. Um, those, are, those folks really, really instrumental, and, and overseeing the entire project um, and I, I want to give um, Steve just a, a minute or two, whatever he wants to take, just overseeing the whole project, seeing how everything worked together. Thank you, Steve, um, so much for that. And I also see uh, Amber here. She and uh, another grad student were responsible for one of the deliverables dealing with a tribal garden. So thank you for your work in that. Stand up. <laughs> Acknowledge it. So I think, are there other members from N NKN here that were involved? Um, just a great collaboration. But again, Leanne and that team up in Plummer were just um, wonderful, absolutely wonderful. So with that, am I missing anybody? This was funded by the Department of Interior, USGS. Uh, it was a small grant, um, a one-year grant, um, but really worked well. And one of the keys to it working really well was the effort right up front that this university, in concert with the tribe, did legally. They fashioned a, a legal agreement, and I want to acknowledge, uh, he's not here today, uh, Casey Ng from our staff, uh, one of our attorneys, working with Terrell Stevenson. Stevens, who is the attorney for the Coeur d'Alene tribe, working out a, a legal agreement, a template that can be applicable for all research, both faculty and graduate student as they work with the Coraline tribe. It's a template that would be modified in time, but it protects both the intellectual property and the traditional knowledge of the tribe while allowing a real effective way in which researchers can go about their work that, that results in a, 
a good product and collaboration. So that agreement, which is on this page, is really uh, a gem and, and will be really useful. Uh, that took some time to fashion, so we got kind of a late start, but uh, it was well worth it because it protected the tribe and it's resulted in what we have today. And what we have today, I just want to mention this very quickly, um, is not for the public. Um, we have gone through Natural Resources Committee. They've approved it. We've gone through the Cultural Committee. They've approved it. But Thursday, we go before Tribal Council. <laughs> we hope to have had that done a little bit earlier, but Thursday is the final review. And nothing can be shared publicly without the tribe's approval. Um, they want to make sure that anything culturally sensitive isn't in, inadvertently shared publicly. What they have allowed us to do today is use you as a focus group. And so um, the site will show you, is password protected? Hopefully after Thursday, we will we'll give you, there won't be a password protected. It's www.skigwits.org. We have our own domain name, thanks to NKN. And, and that's the site where all this resides. Um, and so right now, we're, we're, we're going to be looking for feedback. We're going to be looking for your input uh, on this. Um, um, so that's really important. You're a focus group um, in that sense. So. What else do we need to say up front? Steve. Steve yeah. well, uh, so thanks, Rodney and, and Ryan, um, the two engineers. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming from, as, as Kenton said, your corner or your place in the institution. The message I really want to leave with you is that um, First of all, we appreciate your support. Speaking on behalf of the Department of the Interior, the Northwest Climate Science Center, and it's uh, the part of that center that's based here at the University of Idaho. I just made a short list of the disciplinary areas in which the theoretical base, the literature, the praxis, uh, and probably some policy uh, are going to roll out. I mean, I really think that a variety of dif dif uh, disciplines, cultural, cultural anthropology, Native American law, an emerging area, constitutional law and policy, research administration, science communi communication, virtual technology design, and ultimately the practice of environmental and natural resource management. So from wherever you come, be watching for where the pathways out of this project might lead into your work and ultimately bringing those all together. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Steve. Um, let's start with the invitation. Um, this is something very special. Um, and the tribe is very pleased um, to be able to present it in this way. Uh, one thing you'll notice, um, we've embedded it with language. Throughout. Um, that last one, that last little turn, that's the challenge. Our ways of life in the world. The project explicitly was seeking to, as a proofing concept, as a work in progress, to try to isolate some aspect of indigenous knowledge. We went to the tribe last May of 2014 and they asked us to look at skigwits, water potato, Sagittaria latifolia, as, and combine all the knowledge and practice associated with that. They wanted that one to be our focus. What we are seeking to do ultimately is elevate the importance and insights that indigenous knowledge and practice can offer in combination with science that both can address climate change. The insights of indigenous peoples so well grounded with their particular orientation to the landscape, they've been through all sorts of changes. Insights that they have should be acknowledged and can go hand in hand with science to address climate change. Ultimately, that's our goal here. Hen quail clinet. Um, so our audience is multiple. Um, Certainly, uh, primary are USGS climate scientists. That's our one of our primary audiences. And we have this site linked to, thanks to Jeremy and his staff working on this, as an ISO um, metadata repository. And so that when scientists go to that repository, working with all the scientific things, they'll have a link to us. And that took some work on Jeremy's part to figure out the schema that would 
allow um, a way of thinking and doing that is so different than science to be accommodated within that, that route. And that, there were some innovative ways, and, and thank you again, Jeremy, for doing that. Um, that's important. So that's one of our audiences. Another audience is uh, high school students and first year college students uh, at, 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 on the reservation, um, their future generations, as well as North uh, Idaho College, Northwest Indian College, University of Idaho, LCSE, any first year college. So there's curriculum involved um, in dealing with that. And then, most importantly, the future generations. Um, the Coralines want to do this for their future generations so that they may have this knowledge. The challenge. Henquil Quinet. Um, uh, there's background, there's a discussion on climate change, uh, preliminary background that we hope that people will access, they really need to access before we get to the module. We'll go to, to the challenge, number three. Um, distilling what that is is very difficult. It's difficult to put into words what that which we want to try to be able to capture the knowledge and practice associated with it. But the best thing we come up with is this Henquil Quinet is phenomena that has existence as a transitory intersection of those participating. Be they human, plant, animal, rock, water, spirit. Linked with place-based oral traditions, what they call the MIP, teachings from all things. Now, whoa. This was a challenge. How, how do we go about that? Why, did, did we get it right? Is this the, the, the knowledge base of which we want to look from? Um, and so we tried to isolate some key attributes of that. Um, th this is transitory. It's an event. It's always a, an event. It's not an object. It's not physical. It's not reducible to sort of materials. It's always in action, always in the doing, and it's an event. It's participatory. You can't be an observer. You have to be part of it. It's very experiential, this reality. It's collective. It's relational. It's all predicated on relationships of the participants, that ongoing relationship. Place-based to a specific environment. Orality-based through the words, not the writing. Um, OK, and these are perennial teachings from the Coraline perspective, from the creator, from Colin Sutton, from the first people, animal people. That's how they understand them. They're embedded in the landscape. OK. OK. Mm. And so right away, we've got some challenges, right? Do you kind of see those implications? <laughs> um, whoa. We're dealing with a non-Cartesian dualism. Uh, Rene Descartes, not part of this reality. There's no mind-body separation. Big implications, no observer, nothing objective, objectified, separate from you. Can't be possible. Hmm, everything is participatory. You can't reduce things to material essence. Uh, no art, you know, Aristotelian materialism. Uh, John Locke would have problems with us, but that's the way it goes. Because they're not going to reduce it to the material, because the spiritual is also very much part of it. Whoa, another dimension. Orality-based. Literacy, as important as it is, and as, as much literacy we have here to allow you to get there, literacy often can undermine their orality, the spoken word. And so we've got to take into consideration some of those elements. A challenge. So we want to disseminate it, so what do we do? This is something, a different ontology, a different epistemology, a different world. We want to share it with people. How do we do that? What clues might you suggest that we use? Music. music. Yes, music. We do want to have some rhythm in it. We do want to have hearing in it, the spoken. How, in a traditional way, is this knowledge typically passed along? And so uh, aligning the what and the how. Don't we want to make sure that how we present this material, how the core lanes present this material. By the way, it's shichumch sh skigwitz. Shichumch sh skigwitz. Uh, there you go. You roll off your tongue now, Ken. <laughs> anyway, um, we want to make sure that the content is aligned with the means to deliver it. There's a, just an 
unequivocal relationship between what and the how. And so we wanted to look at the how. And the how is mimium. Mimium. Do you want to flash over that someplace? Mimium. 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 Storytelling. Story. Music. Regalia. Dance. Uh, language. So important. The oral tradition and the narratives. It's story form that the Sichumps use to pass on their traditions to next generation. So that was the clue for us that we need storytelling here as well. And when you look at the attributes of meep meep bum, unfolding storyline, it's an event. A story unfolding is like an event. You travel a landscape, it's the convergence of those who are paying attention and are in the story. The experience is unique to each participant. It's very collective, very relational. And of course, it's orality based. Huh, interesting. The means aligns with the what? Now what do we do? <laughs> now, we go back to some of the pages. Uh, we are encouraging people. There's a whole discussion of storytelling to help you understand it. A whole discussion of the contrast between orality and literacy, huge. And why, what literacy, how important as it is, can undermine the indigenous presentation. So we have all this back. We also have a little bit of discussion on Hinquia Connet, uh, some of that background, giving you and how it's similar and different from some of the things that uh, Berkus and others have, uh, have introduced to us, like uh, TKs and TEKs. There's some similarities, but there are also some differences in Hinquia Connet and TEKs. We want people to unpack those, those differences. And so what do we do? How do we tell that story? Brian, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah. It's his turn. This is our one collaboration. And again, this was, this was a learning experience for me. I have had success working collaboratively with the tribes for the last four years. And we've published together some great pieces. We've looked at the poetic as a way to format the story um, so you can get a sense of the oral nuance in it. But in all those books that we published together, there's, there's still been something that I have not been satisfied with. Something missing. So that took place in a conversation that we had about a year ago. Almost a year ago to the day, I mean, early in the, in the uh, fall semester last year. And we were talking about just stuff, um, just going back and forth, uh, what we each were doing, upcoming year and whatnot. And we started talking about the virtual and what virtual worlds can do and can mean. And the word storytelling kept coming up over and over and over again. And so Rodney, you know, we, we talked about the, the, the project and, and he, uh, he shared a little bit about what was going on and, and the, the, the storytelling aspect, the orality of this. And he was trying to find a way to share that without using the more traditional sense, without using the, the video, the audio, the, uh, the, the, the literacy, the, the written word. In what way can we share this, the storytelling, the interaction between uh, storyteller participants and the story um, in, in a way that we can distribute it, that we can preserve it, that what, what can we do? So we kind of chatted a little bit more about the virtual, and, and finally he says, well, describe the project. Can we do this? Well, anybody who knows me, my first answer is usually yes. Uh, and then we figure out how to do it. Um, and so we went down that path. We started the conversation, and we talked about it periodically throughout the fall semester. Then uh, somewhere in January, we actually sat down and got very serious about what it is that we were going to do. And so um, what we wanted to do was we wanted to take a visitor, uh, the, the Virginia, uh, Reston, Virginia uh, scientist, through Water Potato Day, or the key parts of Water Potato Day, to have an experience. And then, through that experience, will they be able to better understand and appreciate the, the uh, indigenous knowledge and in some way kind of blend it together, you know, the, the proverbial uh, Venn diagram, you know, the sweet spot where the two touch each other. 
Is that a place where the, the, the scientists can come together with the indigenous? And is that the place that we really wanted people to have that experience? Now, throughout the conversations and throughout early development, what we wanted to make sure of is that we didn't gamify this. Even though we're using gaming technologies, we didn't want to gamify this thing. It wasn't a game, it's an experience. And so we really, every time I'd put something on the table, whoa, what about this, what about this? Um, Rodney would say, well, this is the reason why maybe I like or don't like something. And so we, we tried our best to keep gamification away from this, um, but at the same time make it uh, hopefully accessible to everybody. So we had a, a module, we shared a module early on uh, with um, Emily uh, from, from Reston, Virginia. And uh, she was very encouraging, and so we went further. We said, okay, this is cool. Let's, let's go, let's, let's make this thing more significant. So we started this thing, and I'll, I'll get to that here right away. But I wanted to make sure that you understand that to really understand this module and to take away something from the module, you also have to understand and go through the website. So there's a lot of uh, components in the website that is the more you learn from what the website is offering, so it's, it's kind of working in conjunction with, collaboration with, um, then that makes your experience in the virtual um, a little bit more significant. And of course, you need to go through it time and time and time again, much like uh, the people who attend Water Potato Day. Every time you go through it, it's like any experience, every time you go through it, you gain a little bit more out of that. So this is not just a one of, you, you have to really kind of come back to it time and again. So that, that's something to consider. We're gonna blast through this thing, we won't actually complete it with our time, and we wanna leave a little mystery so you can kind of come back once this thing is public and uh, explore that last little bit uh, on your own. Um, so while I'm starting this thing up, I also want to really emphasize that this, it was very much a collaborative uh, effort. So with Rodney and I here, and uh, Carly Dean and Leanne and Audra and Michelle in Plummer, there was a lot of coordination through email, through visiting. There was, so much of this was uh, an effort of team um, that we would create something, they would review it, provide us comment, uh, words were written for the dialogue, um, it was shared, it was modified. So there is a, a lot of, of what Leanne and her team brought to this um, that is important to understand, that this wasn't a one-sided thing, this was truly a, a, an amazing collaborative event. So when you, when you launch it up, um, whether it's a standalone or there's the, on the website, there is a link to it so you can um, operate from the website. You come to this page, and one of the very first things that it asks you is, are you prepared? Have you successfully, have you gone through the website to the point where you feel comfortable that you have a good foundation from which you can further uh, explore the world? So once you're there, and once you're comfortable, then we take you in. This law, my friend, please select a representative through which you will receive. Audio up. Yeah. Okay, let's try that. So at this point, you have to choose <coughs> you, your, your profile, your avatar. Um, our, our goal is to have more of, but at this point, you can choose a, uh, well, I'll have them introduce themselves. I'm Susan, a USGS climate scientist. I'm Maddie, I go to Russell School. Hello, my friend. Uh, my name is Chuck Reed, and I'm with the Nomi family. I am Brian, a USGS climate scientist. My 15 minutes of fame. <laughs> um, so you choose, you choose your profile, you choose who you are that best Your represents you. Life. Ah. Oh, my friend, I see you are not so attentive. <laughs> we can try again. This time, showing your attentiveness, your actions speak louder than words. At those important junctures in our unfolding story, consider selecting another way of responding and acting. This happens. Yeah, I got caught. 
This happens if you are indecisive, if you don't uh, um, pay attention, you don't respond, and actually in, in the, the gathering module, if you choose the wrong activity. Um, so again, pay attention. You have to pay attention. That's the whole point here. Just like in storytelling, if you're not attentive, you're not participating, the elder will stop the story. Yeah. You have to engage. My friend, please select a representative. And it'll take you back to the module you were at and make you pay attention. OK, so let's choose Maddie. Find Maddie. Let's go to Russell School. Find Maddie. Let's go to Russell School. Ah, Floyd has stopped. Hello. Welcome, you see? When you meet someone for the first time, we like to begin by sharing our names and with a handshake. Oh. We like to welcome you to our land. He squeezed Quay James. Chin tail can meet Quay. I am of the Sea Strunch, meaning the ones who were found here, referring to our original place, to Jack Ella. For this lake, we are standing beside. My family is of the St. Joe River Band, having lived there since the time of the chief child of the Yellow Root. Who said what? Could you let me know a little of who you are? Ah, uh, he's lost. He's Luis Claude Sheffrey. He's the noblest, but no means. Uh, hello, my friend. Uh, my name is Sheffrey, and I'm of the Nomi family. I am Maddie. I want to be a scientist and study plant, so I go to Russell School. It took Brian a day and a half. I am Brian, a USGS climate scientist. I have a PhD in climatology from Harvard University. <laughs> I'm Susan, a USGS climate scientist. I have a PhD in plant ecology from Stanford University. I know they are pretty presumptuous, but we want to make sure the elder is at the same level. They're a Harvard and a Stanford as well. Ah, Professor Chinum. Hello, how are you? How can I assist you? I'm great. I've come to learn about your ways of gathering Sagittaria latifolia. Hmm. Oh, I think you mean these stewards. Water potato. I guess so. Seguats? He's lost. We start by first giving thanks to Kulin Sutin, the creator, asking permission to gather the stewards and letting the students know just how we intend to use them. We try to show respect. Then let's call in Zutun to all students, to well speak them, to link to Chief A.E. Shoo and shoo, over there, do you see that shovel? Today we use that steel shovel. In the past, we used the pizza, the digging stick, made from the wood of hawthorn with an up antler handle. We learn by being attentive, by listening. In Nisan, we learn by doing. Eat food. His love. There. Do you see to left the muskrat? What is our brother showing us? He too gathers the skewers. There. Do you see a yam quet, a basket, next to the chalet? We learn by being attentive, by listening. In Nisan. We learn by doing each cooling. At this point, I'm going to move forward and, and start my digging process. However, if I was Jeffrey, who is part of the Coeur d'Alene tribe, the, <laughs> yeah, I'll get caught, I will. Um, the muskrat would have talked to Jeffrey. He won't talk to us, but he will talk to Jeffrey. Yeah. <laughs> we want to make the experience different for everybody, given their background. That's ultimately what you want to do. That's nice, the woman walking in the back. Did you catch that? Oh, what's the auto about? <laughs> the elder used to point and said, we don't point. We use it if you're familiar with it. His luck, my friend. Do you see the elderly woman over there? She loves skewers, but can no longer gather them for herself. She has had some misfortune. Away, Queen. 
What do you think we should do with these students? We learn by being attentive, by listening to the mesem. We learn by doing each school. Now at this point, and I'll be quick, you have two choices. One is you see the baskets just, it's hard to see on this little dark, uh, but there's baskets just over her left shoulder. We can fill up more baskets or we can pick up the existing basket. Now, at the uh, presentation we were at last week, uh, we had one person who said, fill up the basket. So we did and we got bounced because that wasn't the correct answer. Every juncture is filled with a twirling nip. This one, my friend, to be revealed. look closely at this keyword. How have they responded to your action? This is from the skewits we have been gathering. This is from the skewits that we have not been sharing and respect with. That we have not been gathering over the many past years from this lake. Interesting phenomenon. Thank this you. Lock, my friends, before we leave here, we now say a clean lunch. Thank you to poor Zutu and to the skewits. Lemlech to Kuan Sutan and to the Sequits. This law, my friend, this is our story of the Sequits and what they have to share with us. This is a little of our hidden Bokhanet, our ways of life in the world. Were you attentive? Did you listen to me some carefully? Did you discover something in the story? What meet yep, what teachings has the Sequits shared with you? So this, this scene here, it took us a while to come up with this scene. We wanted a way to share the nips. We wanted a way to share reflections. We looked at different components. We looked at the elder talking and sharing. But we felt it was, again, too much maybe storytelling, too much lecture. And so we, we, we started thinking about what happens during Water Potato Day. And so uh, Rodney and others were, were talking about being in the mud, the lakeside. And then after the gathering was done, everybody comes together for a little food, a little discussion, sitting around a campfire, sharing. Sharing as equals. Sharing ideas, sharing stories, questions, and answers. So we thought, OK, let's do the campfire. Let's do the sharing. Let's have the people. As, as equals sitting around. So here what we have is we have who we are. Uh, we have the elder that was lakeside. Um, going through the, the process, you would see that this is a scientist. Uh, here's Jeffrey, uh, and here's a, another Coeur d'Alene elder. And so um, right now what we have are a series of um, predetermined questions. Ultimately, what we would like to do is develop it where um, the, the scientist, you, scientist uh, youth could ask a question and then the system would recognize what the question is and respond appropriately from the appropriate person making the response, the, the tribal elder or a scientist. Um, we, right now we have two questions that are more science-based and uh, if you click on the button, the avatar asks the question and then the appropriate person will respond. Uh, and then we have two questions which are more based around um, tribal knowledge. Um, so we'll go ahead and uh, click on this one. In digging the skequits, there are so many new things I experienced. Lemlich, but could you explain to me a little more about why we are here today and what we did? Hislach, my friend, we shake hands, introduce ourselves, and explain who our family is to show respect. We pay close attention to our environment and its animal inhabitants. Chileh, the muskrat, is an indicator of the presence of ski woods and where we can gather. We respect other animals and their food stores. The Chileh works hard to gather food for the winter. We gather our own ski woods and do not take from Chileh. We gather as much as we need so we have enough ski woods to share with other tribal members, especially those who can no longer gather ski woods. Spivet means generosity, and Sputem means respect. We respect our elders, the animals and plants, 
and we are generous to people who are unable to gather traditional foods. This includes people who are injured or elderly or who are physically incapable. Some people have categories of animacy and inanimacy to divide people and animals versus rocks and water, for example. Our worldview doesn't necessarily have these categories. We have respect for people, animals, plants, everything. In Shakhtin means equality. Literally, it means of equal height on top of the head. We share this with you. Is there something in this experience that you can use to help address climate change? So to leave a little mystery, we're not going to go through all the questions. And the reveal after the questions are, are answered are two reflections on two MIPS that, in this case, Susan the scientist will share with us. And she, she and um, Michelle, the, uh, the elder, will talk about that. They will talk about the discovery that uh, Susan, the scientist, has made uh, through experiencing this water potato day, through experiencing um, the ways of life and, and the ways of knowing. And, and starting to understand, starting to bring it all together. Um, after which, once you've gone through all that, um, the, the transition into a scene where our, you, our avatar, actually thanks the elder, Lemlich, and then leaves. So it's a complete journey. So they arrive, they meet with the, the elder, they share a handshake, they share a name, they share who they are. They go through the, the, the lakeside gathering of the, uh, the Skigwits. They come up to the, the, the campfire, share stories, share questions, share MIPS, and then they leave. So again, it's a journey. There's journeys within journeys and within journeys. So we wanted to make sure that it felt like a journey, that you, it had a beginning and it had a conclusion to that journey. When it goes live, I would highly encourage you to, uh, to go back through and discover the reflections, discover the MIPS. Um, I think it really is significant. Sir. Yeah, and I think I, there's a term that came out of this that is one of the aha moments for me in working with this project that has direct applications for climate scientists, direct applications for us. Who could? What's what? Dinos. Roughly translates empathetic adaptability. Key concept that, that comes out is by only engaging in this 3D interaction, this orality based experience, you begin to understand the power of empathy, the power of adaptability. It's, it's a critical teaching that the Corley people have had, and they've had it since time immemorial, as they have worked with changing environments, changing social circumstances, changes by colonialization and all that process. All those changes adapting to it is their ability to bend with the wind, the leaves, the branches, with those changing winds, but always remain anchored in the soil. And not just bending, be able to graft, using the metaphor, graft new branches from all together different trees onto that tree trunk, holding tight to their core teachings, but adapting to changing circumstances. It's a really interesting thing. And that becomes more fully developed in the curriculum that we offer. Uh, we have a curriculum that's directed entirely at accessing the indigenous in an appropriate way through story. We have another curriculum that's focused on science and climate change, getting students out to begin to do the science of Sagittarius Latifolia. And then a third curriculum that deals with how do you put these two what seem to be mutually exclusive ways of doing and thinking, and how do you put them together in an effective way, maintaining the integrity of each as they both can work hand in hand. So we have a whole um, series, and that, that little, that phrase, that empathetic adaptability, super what's what's you know, uh, you know, that is the key. That phrase is the key to how we as scientists can work with indigenous peoples or just different ways of knowing, hand in hand, each respecting each way, but each contributing to that. It's a really key aha moment for us. So mention the, the protocol again. You just mentioned most of the products reinforce what the protocol does. Uh, legal protocol. Yeah, again, uh, we, uh, Steve, uh, you, you got a link here. Right. What did you want to say? Well, so what I want to say is Rocky's talking about cultural phenomena being used in competition. Um, I mean, in, co in collaboration. Uh, and so ultimately, 
the legal leaders for the tribe and the legal leaders for the university, the research institution, had to reconcile their differences and come up with a legal basis on which both sides could trust that one of these forms of knowledge would not corrupt or supplant the other, but that they would find themselves together solving problems. So there's an entire legal basis for this, as well as the praxis. Here you go, Brian. Right. So as we sit around the campfire, we're going to be asking questions. Well, actually, I was just going to add a little bit. See, because the way that we got to that agreement was exactly that, was what was by recognizing equality and recognizing that we were dealing with, 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 with a with a sovereign, you know, and, 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 and recognizing that there were things you know, that, that made us nervous about how they go about their, their business legally, and there were things that make them nervous about how we go about our business legally, and and and. and we adapted the agreement to recognize this and that's the way it's been But really, that, that recognition of equality was key. And after that, this, this is not somebody bargaining from a power position. Questions? Yeah. Sure. Yes. Uh, I was uh, pleased to see the reference to Western philosophy, which I taught for many years here at the <laughs> university. But in the 20th century, there were um, new philosophies that uh, were uh, developed. I, I uh, have especially worked with Charles Huxhorn and Alfred North Whitehead. They're fully relational philosophies that are fully compatible with indigenous uh, worldviews. So uh, um, there need not be any contradiction between these new Western ways of thinking and the indigenous primordial Absolutely. views of the world. Uh, Descartes has been long overthrown. And Aristotle went out at the beginning of the scientific age, so uh, they're long gone. I have a question. So I'd just like to thank you for this. It's absolutely wonderful. And uh, Rodney shared with me an early prototype, and I'm, I was blown away then. I'm even more blown away now at the richness of the texture. My question is, it seems that the, the experience has, uh, in, in some ways, it accomplished what you wanted. But as a person on this campus and a resident of this area, I, I kind of want to know the larger story behind this, about how it was created, and what, what, what you mentioned as the protocol here that you established in the legal framework. Are you going to work a little bit to get that story out along with this product? Yeah, there, there are five deliverables to USGS. One is the protocol that involves how do we as a university, as scientists, work collaboratively with the tribe. It's just best practices that includes um, this legal um, document. That's one deliverable. The second deliverable is, is that inventory of trying to tell the story of Skigwitz, Sagittarius Foley. That's here both scientifically, it's embedded in the site, as well as indigenously. Third is how do we link that with how do we link that with a metadata repository? How do we link it to the scientific community that they can access it effectively and see it as something equally valid as science? Uh, the third protocol, working with the tribe, they insisted that as a tribe we have to have lots of deliverables back to them as well, and they wanted a tribal garden. And, and Amber and uh, Abraham, Abram uh, worked effectively on that. Abraham so I put that part together. And they also wanted a curriculum to be able to use. So all those things go hand in hand. And so the full story is a little bit in that introduction. So we don't have everything there. We don't have a tribal garden. We don't have the full protocol. We have a legal document. But on that introductory page, we give enough background of how this came about. Uh, actually, we started work on this. Uh, officially, we got funding, but we couldn't start it until we had to sign up. We didn't start working on this until May 11th. We had to do a 12-month project in 12 weeks. And this is the result of it. So it is a work in progress. We hope to continue this working with the tribe. They want to continue working with us. So as we take it to the next level, really make it more interactive um, with folks. So it's, it's the first stage. I hope that gives it work. We've got two competing distinguished professors. <laughs> I don't know which one to address first. Sure. Who's dressed better? <laughs> it's kind of a tie. Not us. <laughs> Thank you. Well, maybe uh, I'm just wanting to know more about content. And, and you have talked about all 
and we get a chance when it goes live we can discover it. But it seems to me that the essence of the tool right, is to uh, uh, promote an ongoing living dialogue between uh, the cultures, uh, between communities, and between scientists. Right. And so where does the input for that come from? Does this thing evolve in a Right. And it is a, a living, living landscape. That's really great, Sanford, bringing that up. It's not fixed. It's not written in a textbook. It's a website. It's something that can be adjusted. We have a blog established here, and so we're really soliciting that comment, and that's built into this. We have emails, emails that go to Leanne, myself, and Brian directly for that direct contact. We need continual dialogue. We need adjustment. We need to bring in other voices. This is simply a proof and concept. Can we, I guess the question ultimately is, have we aligned Henquilquinet with the means of telling that story, the means, Mimiam, with the 3D? Is there an alignment? That's the big question. Can this be a more effective way to share what the tribe wants to share publicly? There's a lot they don't want to share. But to the extent that they want to share this, can this means effectively communicate <coughs> and bring together that community of dialogue, not seeing it as a final product, but as an ongoing product in which you and you know, all of us participate to continue this project evolving. Uh, yes, it has to be. And that's the exciting thing about this. There's, so we, some, there's some things to learn from the Toolbox project here. Actually, if you look at Toolbox, it's different disciplines with fundamental philosophical differences learning to communicate. This, in a way, could be argued to be one, one step more difficult between cultures in a more profound sense. But it's really a cousin to it. And so we're, we will learn much from Toolbox and how it populated its conversation as a guide to how we populate this conversation. Oh, so what my sense is vice versa. Vice versa? Yeah. Absolutely. Sir, have you had issues with avatars that too closely resemble the living? <laughs> yes, we did! Oh, my God! <laughs> good question. Who wants to go? It's still evolving. Um, you know, the, the last, uh, in, in any good project, there's a point where you put the pencil down. And we had to put the pencil down uh, before we fully developed um, this avatar here, Michelle. Um, so Michelle has gone through numerous iterations, and she's not that. Neither is, is Chip. Um, so as we, we kept going through and it's in some ways, you know, when we first looked at the avatars, that was okay. I think as they got to know them, as they saw the personality through the dialogue and what they were doing, then they stopped looking. They weren't enamored with, oh, that's cool thing moving on the screen anymore. They were looking at the avatar. Uh, for the first part, um, when uh, Lakeside, Michelle walked up. She's an elderly lady. She walked up just spry and just da -da -da, like kind of thing. And, you know, and we just kind of left it because it was working, blah, 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 until finally somebody said, is this lady elderly? And we went, oh, yes, right. So we circled back around and brought forward some uh, more, uh, an elderly walk and an elderly idol when she's standing there. So yes, her, person, her personality is developing. Jeffrey needs to develop some more. Um, are, they, are they identical? You know, like did we use somebody as, as a model? Um, <laughs> in name, but not necessarily in physical appearance, um, but there's, Again, ongoing conversations. About there, there was an inside joke yeah. <laughs> that the boys put on that, they, that, that the other person didn't appreciate, so we had to change somebody's name. Had sets of For example, changes. there's a lot of fun yeah. at that level. And but all, but okay. they, they, I mean, Audra and, and, and Caroline, we've got to have a scarf on that woman. Yeah. We've got to have a, a shawl around her. What's going on here? And those little things are pretty hard to make at this point. But you know, there's going to be endeavors to, yeah. to flesh that out even further. And, and it was good because I think once we had the indigenous voices, once we had the, the, the tribal voices on the, on the avatars, it felt different. And there was a, a different perspective. So originally it was myself and Rodney 
and my wife uh, doing the voices. And, 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 and oh, uh, where, where are you? Chris, Chris. We Chris Roby, a scientist. Was, hey, she's our sci our other scientist. We have two scientists, the wives, um, uh, the smart ones. Uh, and uh, it evolved. And all of a sudden, the personality of the voices came in. Then Rodney came back with some recordings of the youth. Um, they were in a language class. And, yeah, and, and they did it. They, they yeah. basically wrote the script. Yeah. It's not us. They wrote the script. They won That's the way they wanted to say things. And, and, the, and the end talks by the elders, those are scripts written by Audra and Michelle and Leanne. They, 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 that's the message they wanted to get across. So they took full charge of that, that part of it, for example, not only in just the fine tuning of everything, but. And it influenced what we did. So again, this wasn't a lineal process. It's very, very iterative and, and very collaborative. And so as new things evolved and developed, um, it came to life. And as we saw them, we, we, we shared our, our feedback about them. <coughs> and made changes where, where it was necessary. And it's still evolving. It's, it's certainly not a done thing. Other? Um, Brian, to follow up on that, so did you actually sample uh, the voices of, of uh, yourself and Rodney and, and others, or, and then the, uh, just you enter the, the dialogue and the computer generates the, the speech, is that? We, uh, uh, simpler. Um, we literally just recorded on an audio device um, the, the voices. You know, so we had, at, at first there was a, just a little bit of, of script and then a little bit of ad lib and then ultimately the script evolved. And then we just recorded the voices and then we just brought the voices in, um, cleaned them up the best we could. We were, again, 10, 12 weeks, we were at full flight. Uh, the voices were recorded, I think, on three or four different devices. And so at times it was a bit of a challenge to make them sound like they're in the same space. Um, but again, we just, we kept moving forward. But it was literally just like that. We, the recording sessions, we would put the mic in there and we would just talk the people through. It'd say, look at me, talk to me, don't talk to the microphone, don't read, talk to me. And it really just started to dynamically change. And you can't put words in their mouths though. You have to record the words yourself. Correct. You can't manipulate that. Right, yeah. So we, we gave suggestions, um, and then the, the dialogue changed over time. It, it actually changed in real time right there. Yeah. If we felt it felt too stiff, we, we would say, like Michelle was uh, uh, doing her, her dialogue, and she would say, this feels too stiff. She would say it feel, felt too stiff. And we would say, fine, just tell me what Change you want to say. And Tell them your great. words. Bang. Out it came, and it was just it captured it perfect. And it's not, you know, this is a proof in concept. We still have a lot of work to do on it. It still reads a little bit like someone's reading it. You know, we've got to move to another level. But this is just the beginning. And, and again, with your input and your help, we want to make this a continual collaborative project. Um, it is to be shared. I have just one more question. How, how do you make the experience ADA working on that. Um, I have a colleague um, from one of the virtual communities I belong to, and uh, once this goes public, I want to share this with her. Um, she works with a community called Virtual Ability, and her role is to help people who are, um, have some disability, doesn't matter what it is, use assistive devices to work in the virtual world. Uh, I was at a conference that she was hosting, and what was most amazing is partway through the conference, I just realized how many people sitting there in this virtual world had some level of disability. And they were just fully engaged. They were fully participating. That's a testament to uh, what, uh, what Alice um, does. And so we've, we've talked about this. Um, I had her work with one of my capstone teams last year. Um, and so as soon as this goes public, I want her to wade in and I want her to, to start to share uh, about that. Kirsten, thanks for that question. And we're going to have an opportunity through this year as we lead up to June of next year. You all will see an announcement here shortly that University of Idaho and the Northwest Climate Science Center, Rodney Bryan, we have been, we were asked by the a Association of 83 Tribes from the Northeast, Southeast, and Northwest U.S. to please come forward, take what we know about the climate boot camp, and institute the first national tribal climate boot camp. We will be leading that now as the director of that. It will be June next year at the McCall campus, who is at the same time looking at itself and saying, is the experience at McCall ADA basic? So 
very relevant uh, to your question. Also, um, Rodney, you, you um, talked about the value of elderly people, so I think that's an opportunity for me to talk. Um, there, there's, there's one thing that can be very frustrating to a person who comes out of the empirical science world who has been trained so carefully and rigidly and rigorously to carry out that, that process to watch something like this and be reaching for more what they sometimes describe as substance. Keep in mind this is about a process of generating knowledge as well as a certain kind of knowledge. And we are uh, now all the way <coughs> in climate science about adaptation, right? Well, think about the other side of this equation, the, the native knowledge. Would this not be an example of a people who have figured out what adaptation is? So there, there are many powerful pieces coming across this transit in both directions. And I encourage you all to come out of the strongly definitive empirical base don't devalue it at all. It start to add value to what Rodney and Brian have built a bridge to. And Leanne, Carol Dean, and Audra. And one more analogy. Lori Wall's daughter, Elsie, was such a trooper. She provided the voice for our, our youth. And so uh, it was an amazing. I've never met Elsie. Uh, and she's recorded in Genesee and, and Portland and probably in places in between to help us make this project successful. I'm afraid we're out of time for today, uh, but uh, we do have a listserv for the Renfrew Colloquium, and if uh, you're not on it, see me afterwards, and I'll be sure that you receive uh, a notification uh, once uh, the, the team has notification that the project has been approved by the Coeur d'Alene Tribal Council and that uh, the site is live, and I'll include the uh, URL for the, the site so you can continue this uh, dialogue uh, virtually through uh, the, the site. Um, so before we thank uh, our uh, presenters today and all of the collaborators in the room, I'll again invite you to come back next Tuesday uh, in this room for a presentation on the economic impact of the five tribes of Idaho, including the Coeur d'Alene tribe, which has a significant economic presence in North Idaho, as well as this social and cultural and scientific legacy that the, the university is helping to, to document and share with others. Uh, so, uh, Stephen, Rodney. Just one uh, comment. Rodney. If you do Google skateboards right now, all you're going to come up with is squat. Um, <laughs> but it will be www.skateboards.org. The spelling of it is critical. <laughs> Again, well, thank you for your time and expertise, and thank all of you for being here.